When a market behaves according to fundamentals, it's easy to track. When there is euphoria and manipulation, it becomes quite difficult. Today we have a narrowing band of investments, many passive investors, and a recipe for certain disaster. But enough with the gloom and doom. Let's talk about unicorns and rainbows instead. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today, you're not going to get any rainbows. You're not going to get any unicorns. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Let's get into some reality, and I want to begin by taking a look at this article out of CNBC. It's talking about Robert Schiller. You probably know him of the Case Schiller Index. He's always being quoted because of how important that data is, all right? So he tracks the P.E. ratios, he's tracking housing prices and so many other factors. Economists all over the world use the data that he provides. The longest bull market in history could be showing worrowing echoes of one of the greatest crashes Wall Street has ever seen. We're talking here about Robert Schiller and he's worried today and I'm going to talk about what he said here. The 1920s is quite a legend that people are often thinking about. I look at 1929, particularly at the end of the Roaring Twenties and it ended in a bout of speculation. Between May and September of 29, the stock market went up over 30% in just a few months. And what he's saying is that this happens to be a similar pattern as to what we saw back then. There are, of course, different scenarios. There's a lot of different things happening today that were not happening back then. But he says that he is worried. There are many factors here at play clearly. And what he talks about is all in line with what we have seen with too much debt, terrible deficits, the Federal Reserve is inept and unable to deal with the problems that we are facing today, and the government is obviously going to have to panic when the time comes. What he's suggesting is that, you know, a year ago, two years ago, we weren't in the same situation that we are today, and so you can take the advice or you can not, Robert Schiller has the data, and that's what you need to pay attention to, the information, not opinions. Let's look at this here. The yield curve has a strong leading relationship with the VIX, and I found this to be interesting as well because the VIX index, it is a confirmed fact that the Federal Reserve has a short position on the VIX. They've been pushing this down even though we should have been seeing mass amounts of volatility through Throughout 2018, there was just one spike, but that spike did, in fact, pull the entire market down. You're looking at the VIX in the yellow line, and the blue line is basically the uh, yield curve. And what we have to be worried about is that every time it does this, we happen to have a recession. We enter a stage of volatility. I'm not saying it's going to happen today. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. But you should be paying attention because this type of information is very relevant. It's relevant if you have investments. It's relevant if you have a pension fund. It's relevant if you're worried about the price of your home. It's relevant if you have a mortgage that needs refinancing at some point, if you're going to move into a new house at some point, if you have a variable mortgage rate or a variable loan of any degree, if you have credit card debt, or if you're worried about the neighbors around you. This is all a factor for basically everybody because everybody's job is at risk and industries could disappear in the next recession. When companies go into recession mode, if you've ever worked for a big corporation, especially during the financial crisis, they go into this whole mode of increasing productivity. And I heard this myself, thought it was quite interesting that you would hear increasing productivity and you would think, okay, well, maybe you gotta work twice as hard, maybe you gotta work longer hours. Increasing productivity basically means we fire a bunch of people and we make them other people do their work. That's increasing productivity and that is, in fact, the case for the next time around and surely after that. They're gonna try to do away with as many employees as possible, try to use robotics, try to use automation and just not rehire when the time comes. A lot of people think it's temporary, but 
you know, in this case here, they're trying to do away with uh, human beings, whether it's in the financial industry with the robo-advisors, they are getting rid of tellers by using iPads, and then you'll have a simple customer service representative instead. They are going in this direction, not just the financial industry, but certainly all over the place. High-quality stocks have historically outperformed during periods of rising volatility. When you enter these um, you know, areas, you're obviously going to have to readjust your portfolio. And during this readjustment, you're going to be looking for safety, you're going to be looking for stability, you're not looking for growth. So a lot of these companies, these big companies, they sort of get a lot of that if they're handing out dividends, if they're able to basically show investors that they have been safe and secure for a long period of time through the last recession, through the one before, and so on. So this here shows us that there is a correlation there, and essentially that's all I wanted to mention. You you know, it just goes in order. Basically, the higher quality the stock is, the more money's gonna come to it during tough times. It's pretty obvious, but it shows you here on the chart. Most companies going public this year entered their debut with a history of losing money, but investors are embracing them anyway. This isn't just tech stocks, of course. It shows the data, you know, all of them are doing this. It doesn't matter what the company is doing. As long as there's a good idea there, people will throw money at it. And we're not talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about billions of dollars in some cases. Through last Friday, 83% of U.S. companies going public in the first nine months of this year lost money in the 12 months leading up to the IPO. 83%. I didn't say 8%, I didn't say 3%, I didn't say 8.3%, I said 83%. Basically what that means is every company that has, has an IPO that's coming onto the market is losing money. That's not supposed to happen. But these days, nobody gives a damn because we're in the euphoria stage of the market. People don't like to hear about it, but if you're tuning in for some unicorns, if you're tuning in for rainbows, this is not the rainbow unicorn GPS. It's You're on the wrong channel. There's probably another channel. The previous highest rate of money losing companies going public had been 81% in the year 2000 at the height of the dot-com bubble. Now think of that for a second here. We are actually higher than where we were at the insanity of the dot-com bubble in this respect. Companies come online and they're already losing money. What does that mean for you? That means they better turn it around quickly or they better have some very, very unique prospect on the subject of money. There are some companies which do this and they're sort of betting for the long term and I understand why they're doing this and there's a lot of, let's just say, uh, a lot of propaganda being used in order to make you think that that's okay. But I believe that in the next recession, you're gonna see these type of companies which have been burning money, that money fl flees out of there as quick as possible. And money's gonna go into those safer investments. How do I know that? Look at the other chart I just showed you. It's very clear to me that history will prove to repeat itself in this case. Percentage of the IPOs with negative earnings. Here's the historical data since 1980. Checking this out here, basically just showing you what I just showed you, but in a graphical sense. And now for some information nobody cares about. Federal debt has increased by at least $1 trillion in eight of the last 11 fiscal years. You can see it here on this chart, but it doesn't even matter. Debt increases. Deficits increase. Taxes increase. And nobody cares. Nobody cares, and it's a fact. You can ask, ask anyone in the financial world. Does this matter? No, we owe it to ourselves. We're doing fine. Well, I guess we have a difference of opinion. And this here is the federal debt finished fiscal year 2018 at 21.5 tr tr trillion that's with a T, trillion US dollars. One trillion dollar increase over the last year. And today we can see that it's just gonna get worse. 
It's only going to get worse, but nobody cares. Something's got to give at some point, but certainly the debt, I don't know about that. The debt is being used to control individuals today, and it really, really worries me. Not for the individual, not for the nation, not for the corporation, but for all of them. All levels are in too much debt. And when you are in too much debt, you are in a state of servitude to those who have lended to you. Remember where money comes from. The central bank is the one who is basically printing the money. It goes through the financial system and makes its way into your hands. You decide what to do with it. Do you invest in something that is safe, secure, that's something that's providing you with income, that's multiplying your money, compounding it? Or do you buy the latest gadget out there? Are you spending all your money going out and partying? Are you improving yourself by investing in books, in courses, in knowledge? Or do you want to party? This is the difference. Right now, we are seeing that on many levels. The companies, the nation, the nation's going out there to party. They're not going out there to invest in itself as much as they should be. Why? Because it's not cool. It's not cool. Books aren't cool. Knowledge isn't cool. Apparently, going out to party is cool. I guess guess I'm not cool. If you found the video informative, please give me a thumbs up. When you give me a thumbs up, it helps to support the channel. So I do appreciate that very much. And if you want the financial education you were not taught in schools, these two books have it all. When you read these two books, you have everything you need to know to begin the journey. I wish, I wish I had these two books to read when I first started because you're reading these extremely complex economics texts and it's just confusing. It's just mind-boggling at, you know, what am I reading? What, like, what the hell? Can I just start from the beginning? I, I started from page one, but I'm not getting the beginning. Then I read another book. Okay, I, you know, and, and you piece it all together, which is one of the reasons I started writing the book was to formulate it for myself, to understand it for myself. And then, uh, the, you know, I wanted to help my family and friends and so on. So that's basically why I wrote uh, the first book, The Money GPS. And, you know, you, you'll understand so much about the system. And then from there, you can go on and, and get more complex if you desire. You don't have to. But... This just gets you that base knowledge that was left out of the school system. So check them out. Links, links are in the description of the video. If you're more interested in the audiobook version, you can get that at themoneygps.com.